Welcome to Trains 21. This video is sponsored by Army Sergeant Rob of Knoxville, Tennessee. Rob, we thank you for your generous PayPal donation and your service to your country. The battle between EMD and GE is sort of a Ford versus Chevrolet situation. Two different products from two different manufacturers that yet achieve the same goal. Both have been around for a long, long time, so they both must be good. The Piedmont division on the NS between Atlanta and Washington, D.C. has some of the best track on the railroad. It used to be a mecca for passenger trains before the Hartsfield-Jackson Airport opened near Atlanta. It's double tracked for the most part, and there are many sections that allow for 60 mile per hour running. I'm told that the preference for intermodals are the SD70 ACs, the M-2s, the ES44 ACs, and the ES44 DCs. EMD prime movers generally age better in my opinion and don't wear out as fast. Notice how many SD40-2s are around compared to C30-7s of the same era. The older FDLs were a lot like Alcos. If you didn't maintain them well, they'd go belly up. I heard a rumor and it makes pretty good sense to me. Most GE engines were financed by GE. And when the end of the 15 to 20 year lease came up, GE bought the engines back in for disposition. I guess it helps GE not to have to stock obsolete parts. Most operating and mechanical people seem to dislike GE Prime Movers from what I've been told. I guess the electrical systems were a little bit too robust. I'm no engineer, so I've never run a GE, so I can't say firsthand if they're as poor as some people say they are. A lot of the parts on the EMDs interchange. A good example of this is the GP7 with the 567 crankcase could be refitted with 645 power assemblies. Water pumps are pretty much the same on the GP7 and an SD40-2. GE made good electrical systems. A good example of that is today's Delaware Lackawanna Alco fleet. All use GE electrical components. EMD also used GE electricals in the early days before they made their own. GP30s with Alco trucks usually would pull a little better than those with EMD trucks. The basic problem that I see is that GE crankcases are cast steel and are more prone to cracking and more importantly can't be repaired as easily by welding as can an EMD or even Alco crankcase. The GE crankcases don't last as long as 15 years in really heavy use either such as with Hamersley Iron in Australia. The original Dash 944 CW units supplied in late 1994 have all had new crankcases fitted. However, the BHP Billiton that operates in the same area was using rebuilt former Southern Pacific SD40s built more than 30 years at that time still largely with their original crankcases. This is reflected here in the USA as well. There are very few GE units pre the Dash 7 era remaining and even the early Dash 8s are now disappearing. It is possible that GE will never match EMD in the number of units actually in service. Nothing in the rail fan community triggers debates or strong feelings as to who makes the better locomotive, GE or EMD. The answer isn't always clear cut and dry and a lot depends on what factors are taken into consideration. I'm Railfan AC and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. In the first battle of this video series, I compared the SD70 Mac and the AC4400 CW. My personal EMD bias notwithstanding, I think that an older EMD such as an SD70, SD75, or even an M-2 is superior to a Dash 8, Dash 9, or even an Evolution locomotive like the ES44 DC. I'm told that they respond faster and dig in better, which is a layman's way of saying that they have faster loading times and better wheel slip control. I've also been told that the wheel slip control on a GE likes to drop the load to almost zero when it detects a slip while keeping the diesel engine revved up. The load usually drops just long enough for the locomotives to roll back against the train, bunching slack up, and then the computer throws it all back on and yanks the slack out, which is an excellent recipe for a broken knuckle or drawbar unless the engineer catches it right away. And while I think that GVOs are certainly superior to the Dash 9s, they still drop their loads in many conditions where an EMD will keep pulling steadily, or so I'm told. Another case for EMD bias is in the land down under. 
The BHP Billiton system, which I mentioned earlier, in Western Australia was operated exclusively by about 180 SD70 ACE units. Two units would haul loads of 110 cars each of 308,000 gross pounds around 250 miles to the most distant mine. The locals had electronic parking brakes and were run in distributed power sets of six locomotives and about 330 cars. Most of the units were a slightly modified design, but 11 were standard units that were built for the BNSF that became available during a peak in iron ore demand. Previously, the line had used Alco C636s and MLW M636 locomotives, GE C36-7s, and had standardized on GE C40-8s, and they had about eight AC6000s as well. Their competitor, the Rio Tinto, went for C44-9Ws, followed by the ES44 DCI units. The ES44 DCI was built on the AC6000 frame with AC6000 radiators as well as the air-to-air -air intercooling in order to operate in the extremely hot temperatures of the summer. They could not have been cheap to buy, certainly a lot more than a bargain basement SD70M-2. The point is that the SD70 ACEs were completely standard regarding their cooling systems and operated without any problems in the high desert-like temperatures. The fairly frequent turbocharger failures on the Rio Tinto ES44 DCI units don't help in any way with my bias either. Fortescue Metal started with Dash 9s but picked up a few SD90 Max. Some rebuilt as SD90 43 Max and went with SD70 ACEs for all new purchases. So if the SD70 ACEs are junk, they wouldn't have been selected by very cost-conscious mining companies for critical operations in such very remote areas, much of which is the desert. Just saying. In 2002, GE released the first of a new series of locomotives that would replace their popular Dash 9 series, the ES44DC and ES44AC, commonly called GVOs for General Electric Evolution Series. They were designed to meet the stricter diesel locomotive emission standards imposed by the EPA Tier 2 regulations that took effect in 2005. To meet the new standards, GE developed the 12-cylinder GVO 12 engine. Both the bore and stroke were increased to produce the same 4,400 horsepower as the older 7FDL 16-cylinder engine. The new engine drives an alternator producing AC current that is rectified to DC current. On the ES44DC, this powers the traction motors. On the ES44AC, the DC current is chopped back into AC power to the traction motors. These two models share a common 73-foot, 2-inch frame and the same external appearance. One thing that is different is that the ES44DC and ES44AC external details have changed with almost every year's new orders. Some of the changes dating back to the earlier versions produced in 2005 and 2006 include nose doors on the left hand side, two widely spaced dynamic brake vents, X panels on the electrical cabinet, side grab irons on the long hood and flush mounted top radiator grills and radiator compartment doors. In contrast to EMD's SD70ACE and SD70M-2, which combined existing mechanical and electrical components with a largely new frame and car body, the GE Evolution Series introduced a new 12-cylinder engine, as mentioned before, while retaining the frame, cab, and front hood section of the AC4400CW. By the end of 2015, thousands of Evolution Series locomotives have been built in three main models, the ES40DC, the ES44DC, the ES44AC and the ES44C4. The ES40DC and ES44DC retain a large cabinet behind the cab on the left side that would otherwise house the inverters on AC units. The ES44C4 was a variation of the ES44AC with the middle traction motor in each truck removed giving an A1A, A1A wheel arrangement. It employed a mechanism above the center axle powered by air cylinders that lifted the axle slightly at low speeds, transferring a small portion of additional weight onto the powered outer axles for greater adhesion. 
The biggest change in the Evolution Series production occurred with the revised radiators and rear hood section beginning around early 2007. Most other detail changes after that were relatively minor. In order to meet those same stricter diesel locomotive emission standards imposed by EPA Tier 2 regulations that took place starting in 2005, EMD modified the SD70 MAC to create the SD70 ACE and the SD70 M-2. Each model is powered by a 16-cylinder, 4,300-horsepower diesel engine. However, on the M-2, the prime mover drives an alternator and produces AC current that is rectified to DC current, which powers the traction motors. On the ACE, the DC current is then chopped back into AC to power the traction motors. The M-2 and ACE were a redesign of the SD70 series, and much of the external design is based on the SD90 series locomotives. Similar features include the full height nose door and rectangular windshields, the large flared radiators with two fans and the positioning of the dynamic brake equipment at the rear of the long hood. In addition, the inverters were moved from inside the long hood to a box on the walkway behind the fireman's side of the cab. While they shared many mechanical components with the previous SD70M and SD70 Mac models, they received a substantially altered car body and underframe that borrowed from some of the features used in the SD80 Mac and SD90 Mac series. The air reservoirs and associated piping were all moved to the engineer's side while the traction motor cables moved to the conductor's side, as on contemporary GE units. The dynamic brakes were moved from the front to the rear of the hood and a wider radiator section was located behind a lowered and tapered central hood. The underframe was several inches taller than on an earlier SD70 model and resulted in a shorter cab being adopted from the late model SD90 Mac. The radial steering HTCR trucks were carried over and a new, simpler HTSC truck was introduced that lacked radial steering and rode on a shorter wheelbase. Unlike the SD70M and SD70 Mac, which rode on different underframes, the M-2 and the ACE were nearly identical. The main differences were the substantially thicker and more numerous DC traction motor cables, smaller traction motors, and absence of inverter cabinet vents on the SD70 M-2. Visual changes over the production run were numerous but relatively minor, and as the ACE outsold the M-2 by a wide margin, the latter had fewer variations. The dark side of the ACE legacy is that CSX only bought about 20 ACEs right at the start of their production, and this batch turned out to be real lemons. They ended up being sold back to EMD Progress Rail a few years later, and many were leased to CN and NS in 2018. CSX didn't buy another new EMD until their token order of 10 SD70 ACE T4s a couple of years ago. I heard that these units were initially going to be kept in captive service in Florida's Bone Valley, but they've since been fanned out all over the system. I'm told that the first batch of ACEs that the BNSF got were junk. The second batch came with isolated cabs and nose-mounted headlights. The vibrations in the cab were too much for BNSF standards, so they banned all non-isolated ACEs from lead unit use in 2009 or so. All BNSF headlight ACEs are not isolated, except for one special unit. All nose-mounted ACEs are isolated, except for one special unit as well. UP, NS, and any other roads thought the vibrations and noise wasn't enough to ban them. I'm sure that the crews might differ on that opinion. I'd heard that the Bensef's ACEs were at risk of not leading due to their new trip optimizer requirement, which is a GE exclusive software option. You may have heard it yourself on RailFam videos where they get excited when they see a Bensef ACE leading a train.
the EMD 2 cycle 567, 645, and 710 series prime movers are the most popular locomotive engines of all time. Approximately 50,000 locomotives were produced for the U.S. diesel locomotive market, with many more export models built for customers around the world. A concept from the 1930s, the original layout was designed by the General Motors research chief Charles F. Kettering and his design team, and the brilliant yet simple design combined with its ruggedness and reliability earned them the title of the greatest of all time. The engine was originally developed in 1938 as a 567, the number referring to the cubic inches per cylinder, and their overall architecture changed very little over the generations in the LaGrange, Illinois plant, which was the headquarters for the Electromotive Corporation. It was turbocharged in the 1950s and then grew to a 645 in 1965 and finally evolved into the 710 series in 1984. With each new change, the engine grew in horsepower and development and its popularity with the railroads and in marine propulsion and stationary generator applications was brought on by its unprecedented ease of maintenance, durability, and reliability. So much so that most of the locomotives built since the 1950s are still in service around the world to this day. EMD later became the Electromotive Division of General Motors and then Electromotive Diesel, a division of Progress Rail and Caterpillar in the mid-2000s. And despite extensive testing, the 710 configuration could not be made to comply with today's stringent Tier 4 emissions regulations. On January 1, 2015, the most famous and popular locomotive diesel engine ever produced stopped being built for new locomotives in the United States. Ever-tightening exhaust emissions regulations spelled the end for this exceptional workhorse. And although extensive work development got the engines to be Tiers 1, 2, and 3 compliant, the stringent Tier 4 level which went into effect on January 1, 2015 spelled the end for the continued use of this engine in newly built U.S. locomotives. The good news is that because of this engine's popularity and longevity, the familiar sound of a passing EMD will be with us for a long time to come. And whether you're talking about a turbocharged SD40-2 or a whiny GP9, there are enough old school EMDs out there to ensure that the greatest locomotive engines of all time won't be fading quietly into the night. As well, these engines will likely continue to be popular in other parts of the world and in repowering operations where the remanufactured older locomotives are not held to such high demands. The best news is that the used locomotive market will be bubbling with fresh activity as interest in rebuilding locomotives arises as an alternative to unproven, more costly, and more maintenance-dependent new equipment. We talked about this modern-day phenomenon in videos T-155 and T-137. As a certified foamer, I've always favored EMD, but when you tell people that EMDs are junk, it has to make you wonder. I've heard that Union Pacific's SD-70Ms all 1,400 plus of them creak, and that's the kind of statement that can definitely burst an EMD man's bubble. UP also used to use the SD70 Aces as helpers out of San Luis Obispo on the Cuesta grade as they'd replace the tunnel motors. I'm told that they came through Roseville all the time, as did the SD70Ms, which, to be honest, probably do creak now considering how old they are. What never came through Roseville except the sitting deadlines were the Dash 9s, or at least that's what I'm told. They were banned from the UP in California, and UP rebuilt some of their SD60s, and a bunch were still being used until the new T4 units started to push the SD70Ms into the locals. SD75Ms were said to have computer issues. CRTs would crash and go dark in the middle of a run. The only fix was to shut everything down and reboot the whole system, which would take a while. BNSF rebuilt their SD70 Max and their SD75Ms, but why? Especially if you consider that the SD75Ms are a relatively small group and are supposed to be crap. Two events conspired to bring GE to the top. Number one, GM took its eyes off the ball and they stumbled. Their offerings subsequent to the SD40-2 were sometimes marginal at best and the ownership woes of EMD didn't help the quality of the product at key times. Basically, it was cast off by GM and didn't really get much attention from other owners. Cat is the first owner that really gives EMD its due, which is good, but they lost a healthy 20 years of having adequate resources, so I have to give it to the EMD guys for doing more with less. Number 2. A guy named Jack Welsh took over at GE. Welsh reinvigorated GE and determined that all businesses under the GE umbrella must become number 1 or 2 in their respective markets, or be sold off or closed down. GE decided to put more resources behind locomotives. The outcome is that GE has now been number one in locomotives for at least three decades. 
GE's lead in financing also led to their conquest of market share. I touched on that concept in our last EMD vs. GE video and video T155. With GE, remember making sales isn't always about the product but also about the deal itself. GE Capital is essentially one of the largest banks in the world and GE was able to aggressively finance locomotive purchases and make very attractive deals. EMD never really had a financing arm that could compete with the likes of GE Capital, but now with CAP maybe they can do something better. GE Capital killed EMD in my opinion. The ability to leverage sweet financing deals meant droves and droves of GEs hit the market. This at a time when EMD's parent GM was unsure of its own core business very much lessened the competitive stance. You can make a superior product all day, but if you can't cut a deal to sell the thing at attractive prices, options, and perks, then you're toast. While the SD50s and GP50s had crankshaft and electrical system issues, the SD60s were great locomotives as I pointed out in other videos. GE just beat out EMD slash GM on financing and they were a much stronger company at the time. EMD just never got back ahead. EMD also stumbled with the Super Series, but it was GE Financial Services that ultimately beat them. GE was offering a cheaper upfront cost and in-house financing. It was cheaper to get lots of new Dash 8s and 9s compared to SD60s and 70s. GM was less incentive to keep up and had a bit of an innovator's dilemma because they were expensive up front, but cheap and easy to maintain. That model had worked for such a long time. But let's remember who controls the decisions of which locomotives to buy. And it's not the people that actually run them. It's the bean counters. Those that keep track of the historical cost of all forms of locomotives that the carriers operate, as well as understanding the company's financial situation and all the ins and outs of the various financial packages that are available. This is what happens when the accountants take over. No offense to any accountants out there, but it seems to be true in any business or industry that I've seen. Professionals know that sometimes you have to spend money to make money. Accountants seem to think that you make money by not spending money. Don't believe me? Just look at today's PSR. While you're at it, look at the U.S. auto industry. They had a 30-year free ride after World War II. They got fat, they got dumb, and they got lazy, and they lost their competitive edge. You probably recognize this train. It's the Enola Bound Train 11Z, and it's operating with a K81 crew out of Taylor. If you don't know the story of this train, make sure you check out the last video I did, which was on the derailment on the Y. But moving along here, notice that lead unit. Well, actually, notice the first three units. You have Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. These three units came up on the date on the previous day's 14R. But the reason I bring this train to mind is because number one, that lead unit, number 8122, is an ES44AC that was part of the 2012 year order. But despite the video title, it's actually not the star of the show. The star of the show is the last unit in this consist, SD70M-2, number 2707. Like I keep on saying, the SD70M-2, along with its cousin, the AC-powered SD70ACE, in my opinion, were very rugged, durable, and reliable locomotives. Now, this train slowly making its way into Taylor Yard is the Taylor to Binghamton, New York turn job, the K82. Now, take a look at the second locomotive on this consist. Did you notice the way the engineer dimmed his lights and gave me a horn and bell salute? Well, of course you did. Well, that's because the engineer on this train is none other than Val Miller. Now, me and Val, as I mentioned in other videos, we go back, well, it's been 19 years now when I first met Val, back in 2003. And I met Val up on Penobscot Mountain back when he used to run the 30T and 31T trains between Allentown and Buffalo, New York. But by the time they were abolished, they were no longer Allentown to Buffalo trains in return. They were now Binghamton, New York to Enola trains in return. But by this time, or by that time, Val was no longer running those trains. He was now running the K82. 
That started on September 15th, no, September 18th when NS took over the line. But the reason why I bring this up is because Val is such a gentleman that to this day, whenever he sees me trackside, he does exactly what you just saw. He dims his lights for me because he knows it makes it easier to take the picture, and he'll usually give me a horn and bell salute. That's what you call professional courtesy. Both times that we caught the 2707 were in 2017, but a couple of months ago, V12 Productions, who's a rail fan out of Atlanta, Georgia, did a video in which the 2707 was spotlighted with a very, very uncertain future. If the railroad operates in a very hot climate, then I definitely go for the ace every time. Like I said in part one, in the Pilbara area of Western Australia, one railroad uses the stock standard ACE unit while the other uses the ES44 DCI unit, which are ES44 DCs built on an AC6000 frame with larger AC6000 radiators and twin radiator fans. Also, as I pointed out, Building units on a special frame has to cost much more money, and they wouldn't do that unless the ES44s wouldn't work properly in the high desert temperatures. And to repeat myself yet again, a third railroad in the area has gone directly for the ACE. Interestingly, the Dash 944CW didn't have a serious heating problem and ran with just larger air intakes. And yet another case for the ACE is the Mauritania Railway of West Africa, which uses ACEs in the hostile and hot desert climate. If you plan to keep the units for a long time, EMD locomotives, particularly the engines, tend to last longer, definitely longer than the FDL, the GVOs we have yet to see. Price is also always a large consideration for any major purchase. GE leasing has been a factor in the price war and will probably continue to be. When we look at the less than class ones that have bought new diesels, it was pretty much split in the Americas between Montana Rail Link's Aces and Iowa Interstate's GVOs. That is, until the Florida East Coast took delivery of their GVOs. And although EMD has come a long way, they do have a long way to go to catch GE in terms of current sales. The SD70 ACE is a good machine, especially with the isolated cab, but I've heard that some units experience problems with software, piston rings, and electrical components. Meanwhile, the GVOs are said to keep thumping along with only minor gaffes, some fuel injector issues, and problems with some turbochargers that was attributable to a supplier. And it also seems that their 6% better fuel economy is also helping to settle the debate, especially in view of the rise in fuel costs over the last year. The ACES engine had finally caught and maybe even slightly surpassed the FDL in fuel consumption, but the GVO has ended the argument and the SD70 cannot close this wide gap. At least two railroads have thrown in a towel on the SD70 ACE based on fuel economy alone. As I've said many times and will continue to say, I'm definitely an EMD fan, but reality's reality. Another difference which I continuously talk about is the control system for the AC traction motors. The GEs have an inverter for each traction motor while the GMs had one for each truck. Should a problem occur with a traction motor and say you have two units, with GEs you have lost about 8% of your hauling capacity and the train can likely keep on moving. With GMs you've lost 25% of hauling capacity and may have to reduce tonnage or perhaps stall on the next upgrade. The SD70 IACs have rectified this unbalance but they're still not standard units yet. One of the reasons that old EMD locomotives seem to last longer than any others comes down to parts availability. GE has never been that anxious to manufacture or license parts for their older locomotives, while EMD has done so with only a few exceptions. As an example, the mass retirement of the remaining SW1s in the early 1980s came about because EMD had announced it would no longer manufacture replacement parts unique to the 567 V6 engine. But to GE's defense, if one needed locos for general purpose hauling, instead of getting 50M-2s at the time, one might have considered getting the 44A C4s instead. You get the power of AC traction, but 
only have four traction motors to maintain, yet they seem to perform on par with any six motor DC loco. There's less moving parts and they have been proven big time on the big BNSF. No railroad orders close to 300 units total and thus they are very happy with them. Also, they are as cheap as the DC motor version of the Jeevo, so you get that advantage too. So, is the debate settled? Probably not. If there are any railroad employees watching, I'd like to know what you think. Do you corroborate what I said in this video, or do you dispute it? You're the real experts, and we'd all like to hear what you have to say. For Trains 21, call me AC.